from the New Arts and Media Studios in Milwaukee. I'm Charles Purcell. This is The Log. I was thinking about my daughter this week. Well, I think about her every day. You know. (laughs) You know, if you're a parent, (laughs) you think about your kids, like, constantly. I love my kids. But I was thinking specifically about my daughter, and when she was nine years old, (laughs) it was a... a playoff game between the Green Bay Packers and the San Francisco 49ers, which is coming up here this uh, Saturday night. Uh, they're going to be playing for the NFC Divisional Championship. And uh, in back in 1998, I don't remember, was it a divisional or uh, NFC Conference Championship? I don't remember. But it was the playoffs, and it was the Packers and the Niners. And I was at my brother's house, and uh, there was a big family party there. Everybody was there. And uh, everybody was there to watch the big game, and oh, it was a lot of fun. And, and the Packers uh, were winning with, with just seconds remaining, and uh, <laughs> and a last-second toss into the end zone by the Niners gave them the win. And, of course, we were all deflated, but I, I, I think about my daughter because she, uh, again, she was nine years old at the time, not th- that particularly interested in the game, but interested enough to realize what had just happened. And as the entire house fell silent in disappointment, there's little nine-year-old Sarah <laughs> yelling, woo and cheering for her 49ers because she was, she was born in San Francisco and uh, we moved to Wisconsin when she was uh, about five, I guess, five years old. So she always kind of held on to that San Francisco identity. She, she held on out of, uh, I don't know, pride. It's just who she, who she was. And, uh, so she was a Niners fan. Well, you know, truth be told, she wasn't a fan of football at all, but if the Niners were playing the Packers, she was going to be rooting for the Niners. And I just remember that moment when all of us, we're just crestfallen. And there's this nine-year-old girl dancing around the room. <laughs> she was so happy. Oh, God, I love her. <laughs> I'm going to have to give her a call and remind her about that. I wonder if she remembers. <laughs> How much do you remember from when you were nine years old? I remember things from nine years old. I don't know. I'll have to ask her about that. Um, I started a little project. Well, I don't know if I call it a project. It depends on how other people take to it. I took a picture of my bookshelf. I don't have very many physical books anymore. It's just a very small shelf, just of the books over the years that I've wanted to keep just for sentimental reasons, or maybe, maybe for reference reasons too. But mostly these are the the books I really care about. Over the years, with each move, I would let more physical books go. I would donate them to a thrift store, to a library or school or something. I, I forget where they all wound up. I, I never once in my life ever threw away a book. <laughs> that, that's not going to happen. That's just criminal. So, uh, yeah, over the years, my uh, collection has thinned down to just really, you know, a couple of dozen books. It's a very small collection. But I was playing with my phone today. Uh, that is the camera on my phone. Uh, it does an awful lot of things that I didn't know it, it did. <laughs> so I was, I was learning about um, my uh, my phone. You know, the, uh, here's a little a sidetrack. Remind me to get back to the to the issue. But a little side note here. Man, I've got so much to learn about my phone. It does so many things that I just am completely unaware of. I've got to uh, I've got to take a little time. I just you know, and and, and enjoy it. Enjoy the the learning. <laughs> and there's so much to be learned about my phone. It does so many things that I have no idea. So I, I think maybe that's a little uh, promise I've made to myself. I'm going to spend some time of my day every, occasionally and learn about all the fun things I can do with my phone. Well, anyway, so, okay, back to the main point. I had my phone out playing with my camera, and uh, I took a couple of pictures just of my surroundings. I did a, a panorama of my entire uh, apartment, and that was kind of fun. I'd never really done that before. 
And then I was checking out some different settings, and I, I took a picture of my, my bookshelf. And then it, that got me thinking then. I thought, okay, here's a little project. I'm going to post this on social media, and I'm going to ask other people to post pictures of their bookshelf. Because in this era, in our Zoom era, uh, everybody, <laughs> for some reason, feels they have to sit right in front of their bookshelf to be on television. I don't know why this is. It's the standard now. And I know I, as a viewer, I find it very distracting. I spend all of my time, I spend half of my time uh, watching PBS NewsHour, trying to just straining to read the book titles behind the guest to the point where I don't hear a word they say anymore. All I'm doing is looking at book titles <laughs> and I can never quite make them out. It's really rare that I could even pick out one or two you know, if the font is big enough, because I'm just, I'm just so endlessly curious about what people are reading. Um, back in the days when I used to go into other people's homes, I don't even remember it was so long ago. Oh my gosh. I would always go right to the bookshelf and just kind of take a look. I didn't even try to hide it. I didn't, I didn't sneak a peek. I just <laughs> went right over. So, man, you got your books displayed. I'm going to see what you're reading. You know, you learn a lot about a person <laughs> by the books they read. Uh, and in those days, by the record collection, either either the vinyl or the CD, if you could take a look at that. Now, of course, you got to break into somebody's device to see what they're listening to. So, yeah, books and records. Uh, I, I love to know that about people. So I went ahead and did it. I went ahead and posted a picture of my bookshelf. And I asked others to do the same. Post your bookshelf. I'm curious. I wonder if anybody will pick up on this. See, in, in my greatest fantasy, then this becomes a trend that literally everybody does. It's as big as Wordle, which, by the way, I have no idea what it is except the name Wordle. And there's, it's, I don't know, is it some kind of word game or something? It's the latest craze in social media. People are playing this game, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> I just told you absolutely everything I know about Wordle. That's it. That's all I know. But it's apparently very popular. But I, I'm hoping that I start a trend. I want to go viral with this. I want everybody to share their bookshelf, pictures of their bookshelf. <laughs> I'm just really curious. Don't you want to know what people are reading? I do. Would you share your bookshelf? Would you join me in this? I should, I should, let's make a hashtag. I didn't even think of that. I'm going to have to go back after we talk here and uh, put a couple of hashtags on that. Share your bookshelf. Something like that. Share your books. That's probably taken. And, and, and in our era, especially as I, as I'm sure I'm not uh, unusual in this respect, I think most people probably have reduced their number of physical books. I would think that this is not at all unusual. It's probably very, very common, almost practically universal. So then the real curiosity becomes, which books, which physical books have you kept? And I think that more than, more than books generally, this really now tells us something about you. Of all the books you've had or read over the years, these are the ones that now in 2022... I still have that I've kept for one reason or another. These are special to me. Now we're getting some information. <laughs> so I don't know. I don't know if this is going to catch on. I really just would, I would love it to. I would love it to. All right. Okay. Let's look at some news. You got any news going on out there? Nah, there's never anything going on. It's always quiet. <laughs> We live such quiet, reflective lives. <laughs> uh, Oxfam. You know Oxfam? It's, a, it's this big coalition of uh, charities, nonprofits, global. I think they're, I think they're uh, headquartered in Great Britain, if I'm not mistaken. Anyway, a new report from Oxfam. Reading now from The Hindu. The COVID-19 pandemic has heightened economic inequalities across the world. 
Not only has the pandemic led to the deaths of millions of people globally, but it has also exposed the weakness of public health systems and social and income protections for people worldwide. In short, the coronavirus pandemic has brought into relief that people's life chances are directly linked to their access to wealth and health care, their positions of power in society, their racial and caste identities, and their geographic locations. Yeah, it's what we're yelling about here all the time. All of these problems are linked, and it's all about who's got the money. COVID is not an equal opportunity killer. No, it yeah, it can kill you if you're rich. It absolutely can. But the numbers don't lie. Around the world, if you're already disadvantaged, if your individual income, quality of life is subpar, you're going to be at much higher risk. The numbers don't lie. If you're in a poor country, if you're in a country with a weak public health system, with an inadequate social safety net, we've, we've seen this before. We see this pretty regularly. This is just so massive. It's especially disturbing. But, you know, if there's a flood, an earthquake, a tsunami, a hurricane, you know, who, got, who got the worst of it down in New Orleans? Who got the worst of Katrina? Remember Kanye West famously saying George Bush hates black people. Remember? Who was it uh, sitting next to him? Um, oh, <laughs> Mike Myers from SNL and Austin Powers, Mike Myers. Yeah, he and Kanye West. <laughs> Kanye West looks right in the camera. George Bush hates black people. <laughs> Mike Myers just kind of looks. <laughs> but yeah, we see it all the time. We're seeing it right now in uh, what couldn't be a clearer picture in the beginning throes of climate-related deaths where there's drought and hunger. Yeah, the poor people get it. The rich folks don't die from this sort of stuff, at least not yet. It'll get you in the end, but so far, so good for you guys. So, uh, so yeah, this Oxfam report now telling us, reading now from The Insider, billionaires have had a terrific pandemic. Central banks pumped trillions of dollars into financial markets to save the economy. Yet much of that has ended up lining the pockets of billionaires riding a stock market boom. That's a quote from Gabriella Bucher, Oxfam's international executive director in their press release. Inequality kills is the name of the, the report. Inequality kills. Yeah, it does. This is something we know, but it's something we have to be reminded of, and it's something we have to see the numbers and how absolutely horrible and unacceptable they are. This is not just lefty theory. This is not just, you know, your friendly little podcast host yelling about inequality. This is real. Reading again. Highlighting the vast wealth disparity that emerged during the COVID-19 pandemic, Oxfam noted that the wealth of the world's 10 richest men more than doubled to $1.5 trillion from $700 billion from March of 2020 to November of 21. That's a rate of $15,000 a second, or $1.3 billion every day. It, hard to fathom these numbers? I know it is, but mercy. Vaccines are meant to end this pandemic. Yet rich governments allowed pharma billionaires and monopolies to cut off the supply to billions of people. The result is that every kind of inequality imaginable risks rising, Booker said. According to Oxfam's calculations, a one-time 99% windfall tax on the gains and fortunes of the 10 richest men would be able to pay for the manufacture of the world's COVID-19 vaccines. There'd also be enough to fund other public works projects, including universal health care and social protection. And this is what we're talking about here all the time. It's, it's not for a lack of money. It's not for a lack of resources. 
Don't ever let anybody say scarcity to you with a straight face and without you telling them, no, there is no such thing as scarcity. The world has what we need. For every man, woman, and child, every non-human animal, every plant, every living thing, every rock on this planet has what it needs. The resources are right there for us. It's all in how we organize life together here. And this is why I'm an abolitionist. It's why I want to abolish borders. It's why I want to abolish money. There's no reason that the artificial notion of money should be allowed to cordon off the resources of the world. And where a handful of billionaires can hoard most of those resources, and the rest of the world can suffer for lack of those resources. This is like a bad movie. These are mad scientists. These are evil geniuses. These are villains in the truest meaning of that word. The charity urges governments to claw back gains made by billionaires. Yeah, I suppose that's one way to do it. I mean, God bless Oxfam, but let's get real. We can't keep in place this twisted system of money and power and expect somehow those with the money and power to do the right thing. That's just never going to happen. Now, if by claw back, they mean take it, (laughs) just take it, all right, then I'm with them. Let's see what else she had to say. It has never been so important to start righting the violent wrongs of this obscene inequality by clawing back elites' power and extreme wealth, including through taxation, getting that money back into the real economy and to save lives. Okay, I'm with you on that. But I take it a step further. We have to dismantle the way our economy works. Okay, I'm with you. I mean, in the meantime, until we can dismantle this monstrosity, yeah, use the tax system. Take it. Just take their money. So I encourage you to um, take a look at this. Got, you know, a mention on the news. Didn't get a lot of press. Certainly didn't go viral. It wasn't what everybody was talking about. The report, again, is called Inequality Kills. And it's a new report by Oxfam. So do what you need to do, your Google thing or whatever. Research that. Get on Bing. Ask Jeeves. <laughs> Is Ask Jeeves still a, th- still a thing? Is that still out there? Yeah, I encourage you. Oxfam's report, Inequality Kills. And it highlights the absolutely obscene results of this pandemic. But it also, of course, reveals, as, uh, as other so-called natural disasters in the past also reveal. Yeah, there's inequality. No kidding. But the extent to some is shocking. And if you can wrap your head around it, we're talking about people's lives here. I mean, this is life and death. Individual disasters, like the, you know, I mentioned uh, tsunamis or hurricanes or earthquakes. Yeah, that's bad enough. But when you get to the two big ones, this pandemic and whatever future pandemic is coming, and global climate crisis, now we have people dying every day. And not just dying, but in, in the slowest, ugliest way, just suffering through drought and famine. And that's not even to mention our non-human friends. I saw this headline recently as well. Sciencealert.com The sixth mass extinction really has begun. Scientists warn in newly published study. The signs of death are everywhere if you look. For years, scientists have rung the alarm bell, warning that grave declines in animal biodiversity around the globe herald the onset of what will be Earth's sixth mass extinction. Despite the looming weight of evidence to suggest this grim phenomenon is unfolding all around us, not everybody agrees. Drastically increased rates of species extinctions and declining abundances of many animal and plant populations are well documented. 
Yet some deny that these phenomena amount to mass extinction, says bioscientist Robert Cowie from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. This denial is based on a highly biased assessment of the crisis, which focuses on mammals and birds and ignores invertebrates, which of course constitute the great majority of biodiversity. In a new study, Cowie and his fellow researchers seek to refute the deniers by focusing the spotlight on the decline of invertebrate creatures, which receive significantly less attention than vertebrate animals in discussions of biodiversity loss. Even the esteemed IUCN Red List of Threatened Species, arguably the world's foremost record of species extinctions, skews towards birds, mammals, and amphibians. The Red List is heavily biased, Cowie and colleagues write in their paper. Almost all birds and mammals, but only a minute fraction of invertebrates, have been evaluated against conservation criteria. The implicit and sometimes explicit assumption is often made that assessments of extinction rates of mammals and birds are reflective of extinction rates of all biodiversity, an assumption accepted not only among the vertebrate-centric media, but also among many vertebrate-centric scientific and conservation organizations. Since the year 1500, about 1.5% of evaluated mammal and bird species have gone extinct, according to the IUCN's count, which isn't so far off the background extinction rate that exists in between mass extinction events. But if we extrapolate based on estimations of invertebrate extinctions not considered by the IUCN, the situation looks far worse. So we have seen headlines over the years Great concern about bees, great concern about all the little critters who live uh, in the topsoil. You and I talked recently about um, not ever using a, a leaf blower again. For that matter, not even raking your leaves because you're destroying the habitat of life-giving organisms that really need the fallen leaves and the, uh, all the natural organic decay that's happening right there at, the, at, uh, at ground level. The more we mess with that, the more we feel we have to groom it for our suburban lawns or we have to put down chemicals and fertilizers, we're messing with that whole system, which is absolutely essential for the health of the soil, for the health of the birds and the small mammals. Yeah, there's been a lot of attention, if you're looking in the right places, of a great disruption to the habitat of the smallest among us, the insects. The bees got a lot of attention for a while there, but, you know, with the way, with the way our media, our profit media system works, it's a, it's a story or two, and then it's on to other things because, well, we know how that works. And like the uh, social and economic obscenities that we talked about today, this is also entirely our fault as humans. The systems we've created, where profit is king, where billionaires have to get theirs, the entire natural world is commodified, seen as resources. I mean, even under that lens, this is a crisis that you ought to be paying attention to. Let's assume for a minute you're, you're a rabid capitalist and, you're, and you and I are polar opposites when it comes to socioeconomic systems. Maybe you love what we've got. All right, let me talk to those folks for a second. You're killing your resources if you want this to last. Now, if you don't care, then there's nothing I can say to you. If you only want this to last another, you know, 20, 50, 100 years, we, nobody can put a quite uh, an exact date on it. Yeah, you can keep yourself behind your walls and you can stay rich and happy. And maybe even your kids can be rich and happy. I don't know. We're going to see how, how this goes. But that's about it. If you, if, you, if you keep hoarding the wealth and abusing the natural world at our current rate, uh, maybe your kids make it. Maybe you can afford to keep them behind protective walls. But their kids won't make it. And then the next generation certainly won't make it. So you're killing us off. So even under your conditions, even under your system that you love so much, all the money, all the power, you get to keep it. Oh, bully for you. So even on those terms... You're killing your own golden goose. 
And now returning to those who aren't fatally depraved, for those of us who care about the planet, who care about each other, who care about future generations, who care about justice, who care about the health and well-being of, believe it or not, people we don't even know, for all the great majority of good, decent people, we have to get off the couch and change this system. We have to destroy capitalism. We have to destroy profit. They are the engines driving us off this cliff. Because you hear sixth mass extinction. Well, that means there's been five mass extinctions before. I don't know an awfully lot about this. And you might say, well, okay, there have been five before. Who who are we to to, uh, mess with the sixth? It's just nature. It's just God's will or nature's will, however, however you decide to look at things. Well, no, not in this case. No. In this case, the sixth extinction is happening because of us. We are to blame. It's the same argument uh, more generally about the climate crisis, well, or, or climate change. Some will say, well, the climate has gone through different periods of warming and cooling. This is just another period. Well, no, no. Unless you want to completely ignore the accepted science There's nothing natural about what's happening right now in climate crisis, and there's nothing natural happening in this current mass extinction. But the good news is, I guess the good news is that we have the power to change it. If we have the power to ruin everything, we have the power to fix everything. It's in our hands. So you don't just give up. And the first thing we can do is we can embrace an abolitionist mindset. We have to abolish borders. We have to abolish money. The very notion that there should be such thing as a billionaire is, to use a word I've used a couple times here, obscene. We're good, decent people. We, we wouldn't do this to each other. We've just, we've just been convinced that there's nothing we can do. Well, the opposite is true. There is something we can do. You'll never take that away from me. You'll never take that idea from me. I'm a flexible person. I am happy to change my opinion based on new information. This is one truth I hold stubbornly that I don't think you can ever talk me out of. Most of us are good, decent people, and we have the power to make things right. Try to convince me otherwise. You won't have any luck. All right. Hey, take a picture of your bookshelf and share it uh, in social media. I'm really curious to know what physical books people have decided to keep. I think it's a great window into, um, into who people are. So if you want to share with your friends, both your real friends and your social media quote unquote friends, If you want to share with them a little bit of something about yourself, uh, take a picture of your books and share it and ask others to do the same. I want to start a big old trend here. (laughs) All right. I'll talk to you next time. I love you. I'm Charles Purcell.